Welcome to the Gentleman's Guide to Gaming for another impromptu live broadcast. This video is going to be one that I promised for a little while and the subject matter is creating a character for the tabletop role-playing game known as Vampire the Masquerade. Now Vampire the Masquerade, as you probably know, is one of my favourite games, so I have, I guess, memorised the character creation process, but for the purposes of the viewers at home, watching on your mobiles, in bed, or watching on your PCs, what I'm going to be doing is screen sharing a character sheet as I create the character. I will be referencing the book occasionally, just so I can quote the correct rules. This is, by the way, Vampire the Masquerade 20th Anniversary Edition, hence the V20 you might be able to see on the badge there. Uh, I'm using V20 because it's the latest edition of Vampire the Masquerade. It's the most complete version of Vampire the Masquerade, and I guess arguably it is the only version of Vampire the Masquerade you will ever need. Uh, it's a game that's been created with a hell of a lot of love by its uh, writers, developers, artists, and is currently supported by Onyx Path Publishing, who release source books for Vampire the Masquerade and the other World of Darkness lines, along with Chronicles of Darkness lines, periodically. I've been fortunate enough to work on several vampire books. I didn't work on the 20th anniversary core rulebook, but I, uh, well, I'm a big fan of it. As I say, it should be the only vampire role-playing game that you ever need. So, what we're going to be doing here today is actually creating the character. And this character is not already uh, existing in my mind. What I'm instead going to be doing is turning it over to you, watching the broadcast. And in order to actually find out your thoughts on the matter... I'm going to have a look at the live chat as it's scrolling up and down on my feed and ask you some questions. Uh, I can see that the live chat has got a lot of people saying it hasn't started yet. Um, and yes, it has started now. Thank you very much. It is a storyteller system. Bjorn is my favorite character creation system as well. I find it incredibly simple. Now... Let's see, shall we? Can someone, if you are keeping up with exactly where I am right now, please type hi. Just type hi. And I will see whether the uh, live chat is actually coming through. I can see the totally random guy in the one is super excited. Mr. Hoopo has just said Aru. But no one is yet saying hi. I need to make sure that the chat is coming through at the same time, otherwise this isn't going to work as I'm planning, and I'll just have to take you through a random character creation of my own. Um, now, as an aside, while I'm waiting for these highs to turn up, there we go, uh, I've just seen a bunch of highs being posted, so there's about a 30 second delay. One thing I was going to say, yes, yes, you can stop saying hi now, Jesus Christ, that's a hey, that's not hi. <laughs> anyway, uh, you'll see I'm dressed down for this. This is a relaxed video. Uh, as all role-playing games should be relaxed and fun. If you don't want to create a character of a Vampire the Masquerade 20th Anniversary Edition, that's fine, because there is a book that has been released called V20 Ready-Made Characters. In fact, I own it. In fact, I wrote it. Um... I don't know if you can see that from where you are now. So Vampire the Masquerade 20th Anniversary Edition ready-made characters has all the characters you could ever possibly want, one for every clan, um, even a Tlakik. There we go. We have a Nosferatu there. Um, we have a fun Gangrel. I wrote that one, and I... I'm pretty proud of that book. It is simple in concept, but I find I'm I'm very fond of the characters within it. So, if this video is not for you, pick that up. There's a link in the video description um, that'll take you through to Drive Through RPG. It only costs four dollars ninety nine anyway. So, to be honest, it might be fun to pick up in any sense. Now, we're actually. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, miso, miso. Yes, I did write that. Now, 
the questions I'm going to be asking are, to start, I want to know about the human that we're going to turn into a vampire. This is something that I do whenever I'm running Vampire the Masquerade. I want to know, or Dark Ages, I want to know who it is that has been turned into a vampire. Because before you start asking about clan and before you start asking about disciplines, the vampire's powers, you need to know who the person was. It's something I mentioned in a lot of videos, but one of the key elements of vampire is the tragedy of loss or the tragedy of loss of mortality. Now, while a lot of role players think loss of mortality, that's great, I'm immortal now. What it actually means is you can no longer speak to your loved ones or you can no longer see them in the same light. You can no longer perform your job, you can no longer pay your rent, and so on and so forth. So let's have a bit of a brainstorm about a character, a mortal. So far, this mortal is not a vampire. Um, first person to post a gender is the gender that our character has. So let's see, shall we? I will wait for the gender to be posted. We're going to do this trait by trait, and I will fill in the blocks as we go. In fact, we'll go for gender, we'll go for ethnicity, and we'll go for nationality as well. Why not? This will all help paint our picture. So there is a delay on this. Okay, so the first one that's come through is a female. So we're going to have female character. Thank you, Darren Cohn. Uh, yep. <laughs> and uh, I'm actually getting several other requests through a female, a Puerto Rican. Okay, we've got a female Puerto Rican. A Caucasian in Puerto Rico. Okay, all right. So we actually have a Caucasian Puerto Rican. What I'm going to say then is we actually have an expatriate, or let's call uh, let's call them what they are. We're, we're going to have an immigrant, a Caucasian female immigrant living in Puerto Rico, or of um, at least Puerto Rican nationality at this time. Now, what do you think she? Do you think she has a job? Do you think she has a family? What kind of family does she have? What's her family life? How old is she? What's the... That's my next criteria. Her age, her family status, her relationship status, her career. I want people to post some ideas and we will start filling in the blanks. So far, we know that we have a female character. She lives in Puerto Rico, or at least claims Puerto Rico as her nationality. But she is uh, Caucasian and we've decided she's an immigrant. Exactly. Why did she immigrant, uh, emigrate? She's a university campus social rights activist. Why the hell not? Okay. She, um, I don't know any universities in Puerto Rico. So what I'm going to say is she is on Puerto, in Puerto Rico for a, let's go for a political studies degree that she's currently in the process of studying. So she is a student. She's out in Puerto Rico. Uh, she's, okay, she has a kid, but she's single. I like that. So she is a single mother, um, and she's 30. Okay, all right, there we go. So let's codify that. We know that she's Caucasian. She emigrated to Puerto Rico to pursue her studies. She's a mature student. She's 30. She has a kid. She is single. This gives her some responsibilities. Now, we're starting to know a little about her. She has escaped to a new country with her kid. Wonder why she escaped. What was she escaping from? Does she have many friends? And does she have a grant from the university to study? These are the last few things I want to know about at this point. Income, what's she fleeing from, and does she have many friends? Any answers from the peanut gallery on this one? She's escaping from poverty. Okay. Okay, poverty's different. Um, I see some people put things like abusive husbands, ex-husbands. 
Hecate was embraced. She ran war. I quite like that. Um, but no, we're going to say that she's escaped from poverty by going to Puerto Rico, which is interesting, which would imply that someone has offered her a lot of money to study politics in Puerto Rico. She must have some kind of mentor, maybe a tutor. Maybe um, she was in a relationship at some point with someone, and um, that's greased the wheels, as it were. She's friends with some fellow expats and a handful of loco, locals, not locos, uh, James Tobias Stewart. I like that. That uh, speaks to um, especially Caucasian immigrants a great deal. Um, British immigrants often, expats that live in Spain, Cyprus and the like, stick to their own little enclaves. Uh, and so I could see her doing the same thing. So we have this character. She's Caucasian. She's living in Puerto Rico. She's 30 years old. She has a kid to support. She's studying some kind of scholarship and political sciences. Um, she was fleeing poverty, so therefore she was offered a lot of money to study there, maybe given a grant from a university. Uh, maybe she's friends or um, is blackmailing someone at the university to get her that much money. Who knows? We've got a semblance of a story. And lots of people are coming up with ideas now. Yes, exactly. Scholarship. Scholarship sponsored by a vampire. Exactly. All of these things are coming together as glue to make the character. And so far, we don't know anything about why she's a vampire, why she's become a vampire, when she becomes a vampire. But this is the point that we're going to decide, because one night, Maybe when she's studying, maybe she attends a political rally because she's studying political sciences. She may have wanted to get a bit of a taste of the town. I imagine she's been there for some time if she considers herself a Puerto Rican national. She's probably been studying this degree now for maybe three, four years. Um, she's taking a master's. Why not? This character is all, all over the place, but these things can make sense. A lot of characters uh, people in real life are made up of lots of different components and you'll generally find if you're playing a character who's just a straight line you'll have less of a fun time than someone who can pull on the fact that they're studying that they've got family they've got friends they've got obligations so she's attending a political rally she takes a break after asking a rather probing question shall we say to the uh, press secretary let's make it modern because there's a lot of uh, probing questions to press secretaries right now although not at, not in puerto rico necessarily she takes a break heads to the bar to get a quick drink refresh herself it's a unbearably hot night as these things often are what happens next? The next person who approaches her at this bar is going to be her sire. Does she know her sire already? Is it an unknown individual? Does the sire seduce her, talk to her, attack her? What does the sire do? Looking for ideas now. I'm not even looking for clan. I'm just looking to know why does this vampire approach her? I like, a, like the idea, Mr. Silver. It's a rally to get voting rights in Puerto Rico. Quite. That, that's a very good reason to study political sciences in Puerto Rico. And the inventor's name suggestion, Sophie, means wisdom. Excellent. We have a character name. Sophie, then. What can she offer to kindred society? Pretty face, good talker, company, political talent. Well, that's actually quite a lot of things. She already knows her sire. But does she already know he's a vampire? She's not being seduced, apparently. He's her gay best friend. There we go. Thank you, Telemachus. So she, he's his, her gay best friend. Her gay best friend, as we've already associated, her friends live within the enclave of fellow immigrants. So it's a fellow Caucasian. Her gay best friend comes up to her at the rally. She's surprised that um, her friend was there because her friend isn't a fellow political science major or the like. So she's surprised. And she wants to know why her friend is there. Her friend actually says she has a modern and smart mind. Thank you, AMW. That she gets in a debate with her about a hypothetical argument about voting in Puerto Rico, whether it should be a thing given the number of Americans down there. There's certain interests at play. Her friend speaks on her 
views politely. I'm reading from the live chat at this point. My friend is nervous. Something is up. Thank you, Bjorn. Sophie asks, what's wrong? A friend asks her to come outside, away from people, to her car, which is parked out in the park. So she accompanies her friend all the way to the car, and the lights aren't on, uh, the lamp lights, this place, much like many others, is afflicted with rampant power cuts and poverty. And so it's a case of holding out your phones to light the way and find the car. They finally reach the car. There's no one around there in pitch blackness. To that point, her friend tells her, we've been watching you for some time. I'm, I've only befriended you for a specific reason. And I'm nervous about this because I really didn't want it to go down this way, but I've been chosen to do this. You see, we, we all really appreciate your political acumen, your way of talking, your academic ability, Sophie, and we want you to join our, our group. Sophie's a bit confused. What group? Are, well, you know, we're all expatriates. We're all, we're all, we're all together already. What what group are you talking about? Are you Freemasons or something? N not quite. We're not Freemasons. We we belong to a different group. And I, again, I'm really sorry. I think the easiest way of doing this is probably like ripping the plaster off. A friend, Simone looks nervous, looks sad. Sophie leans in, she wonders why Simone's so sad, and, are you okay? Puts her hand on her shoulder, Simone looks up. Fangs distended, eyes of the beast, and bites her, and doesn't let go. The rapturous pleasure of the embrace, or immense pain of the embrace, racks Sophie's body, Sophie cannot resist. And it is at this point that we want to start thinking about what clan is Simone, and therefore what clan is Sophie? What family of vampires does Simone belong to and has Sophie just entered that wants Sophie for her political acumen in Puerto Rico, a hotbed of Sabat and Camarilla and Giovanni and Setai activity? Puerto Rico is a conflicted nation she could potentially belong to any clan we've chosen a very good domain broadly speaking because latin america is constantly fought over it's said to have a high sabbat presence but there's also plenty of anarchs there as well so let's see let's see shall we yes it was the worst best gay friend ever uh beyond but you know vampires they suck I'm seeing an awful lot of requests for La Sombra. Seeing a lot of requests for Gangrel. <laughs> uh, Chonyo Guishin. Uh, that's actually a very good idea, Chonyo Guishin. However, I recommend you uh, type Chonyo Guishin into YouTube to find out more about them. Um, that's a particularly obscure clan. Can't say I've ever heard of them. Ventru would be the most common one. Well, okay, so I'm getting a hell of a lot of requests now, loads of requests. We are, I'm actually seeing Gangrel more than anything else. Therefore, the clan we're going to go for is Gangrel. So, now that that has been decided, I'm not checking the live chat for a second, so if you're posting, I will not see it. What you're going to see now is my screen go ba 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 and disappear into the distance, because what I'm going to do is screen share. I'm going to screen share my full screen, and uh, there we go. But that's what I'm going to share. I've downloaded the interactive Vampire the Masquerade 20th Anniversary Edition character sheet. I hope you can all see it. And we're going to start filling it in because now is the point that we can actually 
do so, we've already got some of the basic details. So there's me. Chronicle. Uh, what, what's our Chronicle name going to be called? We'll just call it Puerto Rico for now. Sounds exciting, doesn't it? Now, <laughs> concept. Um, political science activist, I think. And our clan, we're going to select... Oh, lots, lots of options here. We're going to go for Gangrel. Sire. Simone. Okay, best friend. Such a shame Simone is defined by that, but that is how Sophie knew her before she knew that Simone was a vampire. So now we actually get on to the nature and demeanor of Sophie. So what a nature and demeanor mean? You can choose any from the list, and indeed there are more in other vampire books that you can choose from. The nature is the inner feeling of the vampire or the character, the inner drive, and so it, her true thoughts, her true feelings, her true inclinations. They aren't always the same as a demeanor. By playing your nature in the course of Vampire the Masquerade, you can earn willpower points. And what I would say her nature is, based on what we know about her, she is... Hmm, I Let's see... I think the fact that she's come all the way out here, we know she's fleeing poverty, so she's obviously aspirant to some degree, um, but we also know she is a keen study. Uh, she has been studying this degree for several years. So I'm actually going to go for an idealist. Her demeanor, now, I suspect her demeanor is going to be, we've, we've highlighted that she's a single mother, and we had, didn't say she was running away from her child. I think her demeanour is going to have to be something a bit different. Pedagogue would imply she, that she is a study. But I think that she's a bit of a rebel. Because she has moved all the way out to Puerto Rico. That isn't something that you do on a whim. As she's obviously rebelled against something. So, we'll get back to generation soon. The next thing we have to do when we're creating a Vampire the Masquerade character, and I just want to make sure that, yep, you are seeing the same thing I'm seeing. Bear in mind, again, I cannot see your messages at this point, is we look at attributes. Physical, social, mental. So this is where I'm going to take the reins somewhat. In Vampire the Masquerade, your attributes ha are divided. You have seven points for one set of attributes, five points for another set of attributes, and three for another. You can arrange them however you like, seven, five, three, seven, five, three, seven, five, three, or whatever you like. I'm hoping you can see my cursor as I'm saying that, but yeah, you could put physical at the top, you could put mental at the top, you could put social at the bottom, you could put physical at the bottom. You can put it in whichever order you want. Every character, as long as you're not a Nosferatu, starts with one dot in each attribute. Nosferatu have zero dots in appearance and can never increase it. Because she's a uh, political science scientist, she's been studying for some time, I'm actually going to put her mental attributes up highest. I think... I'm going to put one. I'm going to put three in wits. I'm not. I'm only going to put one in perception, and the reason I'm only going to put one in perception is because she didn't tell. She couldn't tell that her best friend Simone was hiding something from her. This is something that's always worthwhile doing. Think about what the dots on your character sheet actually mean as you're creating them. You know what does having four points or four dots in wits actually mean? Well, it means she's probably quite quick-witted. Uh, in fact, very with four dots. So, in fact, what I will do, I'm going to replace that. I'm going to put four dots in intelligence. Again, she didn't anticipate this uh, in any way, but we do know that she is an ardent scholar, so intelligence is where it is. Now, her secondary field not one person mentioned her being a physical character but others did say that she's a skilled talker 
So I think we're going to put five points in social. I'm going to evenly spread it at first. That's three across there. I'm just going to leave it as two in appearance and put another two across charisma and manipulation. And that leaves us with three dots to put in physical. And again, no one spoke of her being weak in any particular way. So I'm going to put all three and even spread across the three physical attributes. So now we have skills. Skills are divided 13, 9, and 5. You can have 13 talents, 13 dots across talents, 13 dots across skills, or 13 dots across knowledges, and 9 across 1 and 5 across 1. Uh, again, in any order you see fit. Now, most characters in Vampire the Masquerade have a focus on talents and skills or knowledges rank second and third respectively. The reason behind this isn't actually inbuilt into the game, it's just something that I think has been observed many times through playing Vampire the Masquerade, and that is that the most, the, the uh, skills or abilities rather that are used more than any other fall within the talent's pool. Uh, abilities like alertness, uh, empathy, expression, it's a social game, and pretty much all of the social abilities are in the talents field. That said, we know that Sophie, our character, knows an awful lot about politics. So the first thing I'm going to do is put three dots into politics. When you're creating your character at first, you can't put more than three dots in your abilities. So I'm going to put three dots in politics. What else? Academics. We know that she is an academic, so I'm going to put another two... Hell, I think I'm going to put three in academics as well. So we know automatically knowledge is not going to be at the bottom rung. Computer, I think she probably knows how to use one. I think one dot is probably enough. I doubt she needs to know it more than that. She's moved across country. I think that would indicate a dot in law. Uh, she obviously knows how to apply for a visa. and how um, We don't know that she's a, an illegal citizen. She was fleeing from po poverty. So I think that justifies having zero in finance. She probably doesn't handle her money very well, so she's reliant on someone else to do it for her. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, well, in that case, maybe, where should we put the ninth dot in here? Hmm. I know it's political sciences, but that's not quite what science means. I think I will put the final dot in finance just to justify that things might be might have been on the upturn for her by moving to Puerto Rico, where all the money is. So then we've got our 13 ranker and our 5 ranker. I think the 13, and I hate to sound um, fairly typical with these things, is going to have to fall into talents. We know she's a skilled speaker, so let's start with... Empathy. She knows how to read a crowd or read a politician. Oh, and expression. So there's four of our points. I think I might put expression up a little higher. I'm now going to go for subterfuge. She knows how to lie, or at least knows how to tell what a lie is. Uh, again, she associates with politicians. So we've got seven already. What's the word on the street? She knows how to pick that up, albeit barely. She's a student. She's not a criminal. We don't. We haven't implied that she's intimidating in any way, and I don't think that matches the character concept that we spoke about. This character is a politician. When she becomes a vampire, as she flourishes, she may become a power behind the throne. She may even become a prince, but not yet. So we have three, five, eight. So we actually have another five dots so let's put a couple of alertness, just to show that she's not completely blind to what's going on. And I think it's fair to say, as a mother, she's got to run around a little. So she's probably got a, but at least one dot in athletics. Also leadership. She probably takes the reins at home. I'm prepared to put another dot in empathy. So that leaves us with 3, 6, 9, 12, 13. There we go. That is our 13-pointer. 
So now I'll put five points across skills. I think we'll put one two in etiquette because again she must know how to handle politicians i think she'll have a pet why not she'll have a pet dog and so she she's good with the dog and she can drive a car we never actually ascertained that she was american uh, we know she's caucasian so if she was american i'd say she has a dot in firearms but as we didn't say state that I don't feel any of these are appropriate, so I think this is a fine spread. Okay, so before I carry on, yep, let's watch that disappear now. Hello, I'm back. Before we get on to disciplines, I'm just going to check on in the live chat. All right then. Oh, sorry, Dojo. Why not a cat? Okay, why not? Sophie has a cat. I'm just going to catch up with some of the comments as I've been going going along so yeah it sounds like from your comments you guys have actually come up with the same uh spread as i did not bad mental social physical knowledge talent skills exactly did i only put six dots in mental or did i make a mistake uh, I'm fairly certain I got that right. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. I did only put six dots in mental. Thank you very much. In that case, I'm going to put the final one in wits as I intended to. Thank you for pointing that out. Otherwise, we'd have a weak character, wouldn't we? All right, then. So, she is a very knowledgeable gangrel indeed. All right, then. So. Thank you very much for keeping up. I did just double check mental. Thank you for pointing out. She has a fake service dog. She takes on airplanes for emotional support. No, no, we've gone with a cat now. And by all means, you can name the cat in the comments. And that cat will form a part of Sophie's past. The character has been built correctly, thank you. So, in a sense, we've built this character as a mortal so far, and she's been embraced. We know that because she was turned into a gangrel by her best friend, Simone, who betrayed her in the car park with a candlestick. And we know that Sophie is leaving behind... Exactly. How does she go on being a mother? Thank you, Omega Draconis. Felix the cat, that's inventive AMW, but that's what we'll go with. Felix the cat, Felix Tibbles the cat, it has a surname. We, we've got discipline spread here, we've got backgrounds as well. So what I'm going to do is take you back to the character sheet now, and we'll talk about that. Why was she turned into a gangrel, some people are asking. Well, she was turned into a gangrel for reasons we do not know. For some reason, Simone's, Simone being her sire, faction wanted someone with strong political acumen and that is what sophie has our protagonist whether that's her clan whether the gangrel require that whether the camarilla require that or maybe it's the anarchs we will ascertain what sect she is a part of very soon indeed so watch as i disappear there we go and now we have the character sheet back up so we'll start with disciplines the gangrel disciplines are from memory Animalism, Fortitude, and Protean. So let's select those at this time. Okay. Animalism is the ability to talk with creatures, command them, uh, and ultimately control the beasts of other vampires, the driving angry soul that possesses a creature of the night fortitude is the ability to weather harm uh, to remarkable degrees only vampires with fortitude can soak the damage from fire for instance protean is the ability to change shape a protean form as it were uh, so at basic levels you can start seeing in the dark you can start 
sprouting claws and at higher levels you can start changing into a bat or a wolf you can turn into into mist or fog rather and you can meld with the earth that sort of thing now what does our character actually have well this is actually where i'm going to turn to the book because this is something again the book doesn't tell you to do but i think is actually a perfectly valid thing to do this isn't power gaming what I'm about to do is look up the disciplines and see which abilities and attributes they require to activate. One of the worst things I've seen people do with Vampire the Masquerade, and in fact I'll do this with the camera on me rather than on the character sheet. Hello again. So I've got Vampire here. Uh, one of the worst things I've seen people do with characters in Vampire the Masquerade is choose disciplines they're really interested in then when they finally get a chance to use them in the course of a game they end up rolling uh, well going to roll and discovering they don't have the requisite ability or attribute very few people kick themselves smile and say well that just means my character is going to be crap until i get some experience ha 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 most people say well shit can i move my points around so rather than getting to that point with Sophie, we will look now at which disciplines suit her best. From an in-game narrative point of view, let's look at it like this. Sophie will start as a fledgling, as a fresh embraced vampire, attuned to certain powers. Those are based on her already existing abilities and attributes. For instance, Protean. The first dot of protein uh, requires no roll, so that's worth knowing. The second dot of protein also requires no roll. And the third dot of protein just requires the expenditure of a blood point. So protein may well be a good fit for her. Moving on to fortitude, we know fortitude just requires, well, nothing really. Uh, so again, it's an automatic power which helps so that just leaves us with animalism which relies largely on social attributes and skills such as animal chem so the first dot requires manipulation plus animal chem the second charisma plus survival the third manipulation plus intimidation so we know that if we choose anything beyond the first dot of animalism that Sophie isn't going to be able to use them terribly well. She has no dots in survival, she has no dots in intimidation. So what I would suggest for the purposes of this demonstration, we will give her a dot in one of each. So back to the screen share. So we will go one dot in animism, one dot in fortitude, one dot in protein. You get three dots to spread across your disciplines at this point. We then have backgrounds. So backgrounds are the, the fundaments of your character. They are the things that make your character up from the mortal perspective. We've already spoken about her mortal past. We already know, for instance, that she has some friends among her community. So I'm going to put that as allies. We already know that she therefore also has contacts. Does she have a domain? I think she probably has a very small house. She isn't famous. I'm going to skip generation for the purposes of this character creation, which will make, mean she's 13th generation. She is a practically thin-blooded, but not quite. She isn't doesn't have a herd of mortals to feed from, and she doesn't have any influence over mortal life. Although, as a student, let's let, let let's come back to influence maybe mentor. Well, we know she's being embraced into some kind of faction. Um, and what that would imply, presumably, is she w will have a mentor. We also know she may have a mentor as a mortal. So let's go for that. Resources. She came here to escape poverty, which would imply she now has some wealth to her. All right. So just for the sake of my being pedantic, no, we've got our five backgrounds there. 
each dot in a background does not equal one ally for instance so it increases uh, I, the word isn't exponentially but it can essentially go from one ally to three allies to five allies and so on so for the purposes of this demonstration one dot in domain means she has a small flat i think that's fair she has a uh, a beach side flat in mentor she has a an aspiring and this is where we're going to choose her sect she has an aspiring baron within the anarch movement now the anarchs want to really gain a foothold in sabat controlled puerto rico and they feel that the best way to do so is actually to get in to the politics side the political side they can't beat the sabat on the streets so they're hoping they'll be able to do so in the boardroom in the courts and so on so this mentor isn't terribly powerful at this point one dot in resources i think is fair and we will say the one dot in ally is simone also a weak vampire and the one dot in contacts is a friend back at her enclave so we'll go up here and select a generation, which is going to be 13th. I actually go for 13th generation characters more than anything else. I think that kind of gives you the feel for Vampire the Masquerade that other vampires can destroy you. It gives you more of a sense of self-preservation and means you don't just go running around burning blood non-stop. On to virtues. You'll see virtues listed as conscience, conviction, self-control, instinct, and courage. Although it says conscience slash conviction, you only have one. Same with self-control slash instinct. As our character is an anarch, she hasn't been embraced in the sabbat. She hasn't received any kind of tutelage in a path of enlightenment, which is a philosophy other than humanity. She has conscience, self-control, and courage. She's a mother. I'm happy to say that her conscience has three dots. We have seven dots to spread. We're not including the three that are initially in there. Self-control, I think uh, she's uh, not necessarily that well controlled. So one, two, three, four. Courage, one, two, three. So there we go. We know that she is a damn courageous fledgling. She had to be. She fled to Puerto Rico. That makes it not sound like courage, but if that's not where she's from, it takes a fair amount of brass balls to move to a country where English isn't necessarily the native language. Uh, Self-control, she lacks that. Maybe she's been known to fly off the handle once or twice, or maybe the self-control speaks to her need to take flight. Who knows? So moving down to humanity. Well, she is on the road of humanity or path of humanity simply because she is not in the Sabbat or hasn't been embraced into a clan that will immediately indoctrinate her into something different. And her humanity matches in dots the number of points in conscience plus self-control. If she was on one of the paths of enlightenment, such as the, let's see, path of the feral heart, it would be conviction plus instinct so it's be the same number of dots okay and then we have bearing now bearing actually influences your difficulties during the course of the game her bearing is zero it only starts to get easier if you do things the higher up you get in humanity and harder the lower down you get her willpower is equal to the number of dots she has in courage so she has four willpower at this point blood per turn she can spend one because she's only 13th generation that means she could only activate let's say god damn it uh in one turn she could activate her protein one of the dots of her protein discipline what she wouldn't be able to do is if she had a separate discipline that required blood points she wouldn't be able to activate that as well as an example the health track stays as it is for the time being the uh, clan gangrel weakness is temporary animal features, which means when she succumbs to frenzy, which she will potentially do if she loses self-control, 
it's likely uh, she will gain temporary animal features such as uh, pointy ears, permanent claws, yellow eyes, uh, fur all over her body. I've seen interesting animal features given to Gangrel in the past, including uh, sort of an eagle's talons in place of feet. The best way of doing a Gangrel's animal features is to make it sound as painful and awful as possible. Now, it may look as if our character is nearly finished, and in a sense, she is. The only thing we have left is, or are, 15 freebie points. Now, 15 freebie points are spread across your character sheet in, well, ways that cost different things. Uh, what I mean by that, because I just described that incredibly poorly, uh, to put an additional dot in an attribute costs five freebie points. Put a, to put a dot in an additional ability costs two. Uh, although if you want to buy a an ability from zero, I believe you have to spend, I think it's only two freebie points, but when it comes to experience, yeah, uh, so it's only two per dot. Disciplines are seven per dot. Backgrounds are one per dot. Virtues are two per dot. Humanity is two per dot. Bear in mind also if you increase your virtues with freebie points, so I put, let's say, self control up, it does not automatically bump up humanity. Oh, missed out for that willpower. Willpower costs one dot. There we go. So I think the first thing I'm going to do is actually give her some status. She has been embraced into the Anarch movement for a reason and therefore she automatically has status. I'm also going to increase the power of her mentor. All of a sudden, the Anarch that brought her into the fold or commanded she was brought into the fold by Simone is more punchy than we thought before. And again, as I'm talking about this and talking about how you assign dots to a character sheet, I'm trying to tell a story with each level of dots before well, before we assigned freebie points she had a weak mentor who probably had no chance of toppling the sabbat regime now with three dots we're actually talking about a baron who could very well knock out the archbishop and at the same time i'm going to put another dot in allies this makes simone her ally who has also just embraced her considerably more powerful than she was before. I could, of course, have given multiple allies, but I think I'm just going to basically say Simone is a bit punchier than we initially anticipated. So currently we have one, two, three, four of our freebie points are spent. That reduces our freebie points to 11. I'm going to put an additional dot in fortitude now you may say that as a gangrel or as any vampire having another dot in fortitude is a bit dull but i disagree i think that sophie is a character who's used to taking hard knocks again after she was, after all she's fled from her home country to come to puerto rico so we know that there is some kind of um, she's been up against it before I think she is prepared to take a hit if she has to. She may not look tough, hence why her strength and stamina are fairly low, but the fact that her disciplines argue that means that it's foolish to underestimate her. So we've actually now spent 11 of our freebie points. We spent four on backgrounds, seven on disciplines. That leaves us with four dots to go. We can't therefore buy any attributes because they cost five each. We can't buy any more disciplines because they cost seven each. I'm going to put her willpower up by one. So we've spent 12 points. We only have three left. I'm going to put two of those. I'm going to bump this up now. Two dots, or two points equals one dot in empathy. A lot of people were saying about empathy being a useful talent for her. Uh, because she's a mother, because she knows politics. I, I agree completely. And the final thing, she's got one dot remaining, so I am going to, let's see, let's give her a little more money. 
that could be it. But in the bottom left, we have merits and flaws. Now, merits and flaws are completely optional. You, no character needs them. But if you select merits and flaws, you can gain freebie points. You can either buy a flaw and exchange the dots that you get in exchange for it for more freebie points, or you can use the dots to buy merits. Merits and flaws are character traits that don't always have a mechanical effect on your roleplay, but will definitely have an impact on the way you play your character. The thing we've mentioned time and again is she is a single mother. So I'm going to find a social flaw that relates to her having a... Let's see... I think there is a flaw that relates to her having some kind of dependent. Uh, I'm just trying to find it. Hmm. Well, that's a bit of a shame. I can't find it in this book, but I believe there is one uh, that means that she's constantly going to be drawn elsewhere. You know... Despite the fact it isn't in the V20 book, I'm confident enough of its existence that I'm going to... Someone else might be able to point out. Ah, special responsibility. No, no, that's, that's volunteering for a task. Sod it. Doesn't matter. I will actually state that that flaw, of uh, which there's probably plenty, is dependent on here. Is it called dependent? Who knows? Who knows? I'll type it in myself. It's going to be a two-point flaw, which means I now have two more freebie points that I can spend, or I could buy a merit. Now, I enjoy social merits and flaws more than any other. I find they have more impact than anything else. So I'm going to go for a social merit already uh, because of her importance as an embrace. I think one of the first things that she does after getting embraced, she gets used by her mentor to become a scholar of enemies. What that means mechanically is you have taken the time to learn about and specialize in one particular enemy of your sect. You are aware of at least what some of the group's custom strategies, abilities, and long-term goals. You put that knowledge to good use. This merit is worth minus two difficulty for all non-combat roles pertaining specifically to the subject of your specialization. Um, you are also a plus one difficulty when it comes to dealing with other enemies simply because you're so thoroughly focused on your field. So now we know what Sophie is doing immediately after her embrace. The Anarchs put her to studying the Sabbat of Puerto Rico, and she does so just as she's been studying mortal politics for at least 12 years of her life. What will she do with the fact that she has a mortal child to look after? Well, her resources aren't going to stretch that far, and while she's intelligent, she may have to lean on the Anarchs' humanity, or she may have to give her child up for adoption. Whatever the fate of Sophie and her child is unlikely to be terribly pleasant. But that is our character sheet. We have created a character for Vampire the Masquerade. And in order to play that character, all we have to do is print that character sheet out or play with her uh, on an electronic file. And when asked to make certain dice rolls or make certain attempt certain cha challenges we just add dots together as an example uh, if she was to if she was actually sent into a sabbat esbat and watch the rituals were taking place and try and identify who the weakest link was in the sabbat pack she could use perception plus empathy we know that that gives her six dice to roll now depending on the difficulty set by the storyteller she well may succeed she may fail but she has six chances to succeed because she has two dots in perception four dots in empathy likewise she, she could be asked to study the mortal uh, politics of puerto rico for corruption that might take intelligence plus politics in that case she has four in intelligence three in politics uh, 
her cat might fall ill and so therefore she has to actually treat the cat's illness or she has to maybe feed the cat some of her own vitae to try and keep it going because she's heard about ghouls she rolls wits plus animal ken that's six dots of course sometimes she'll be ch challenged with something that she's not terribly good at maybe she gets into a fist fight she's got no points in brawl no points in melee either so she is probably going to need some more vampires around her. Maybe that will include Simone. Maybe it will include some vampires from the Camarilla or even the Sabat. Because while we often try and say when playing role-playing games that you shouldn't min-max, you shouldn't necessarily aim for balance, you should all just play the characters you want to, it makes a great deal of sense for a social character to attach herself to a physical character and a physical character to attach himself to a mental character and so on because you need to fill in the blanks that you cannot cover yourself otherwise you end up being a very one-dimensional coterie so that is character creation for vampire the masquerade our character sophie has been created and i'm now just going to review that's it ward bjorn i think ward is the floor i was looking for why didn't i buy any influences darth reaper this is the comment from which i'm starting um influences over mortals she doesn't have any private life farewell do you ever make up your own merits and flaws i have done yes i've uh, written the merits and flaws for changing the dreaming 20th anniversary edition as well um Hunter the Reckoning had the child flaw. I think that was playing a child, wasn't it? Uh, how old is Sophie's child? I don't know. Uh, you decide. Uh, most of you decided the rest of his back, her background. Uh, we don't know if it's a boy or a girl. Some groups super useful. Yep. Um, the child is a changeling. Possibly. Uh, maybe the child is a mage. old friend once made a guy who could only say i say he could also climb good well kenneth that doesn't sound like a terribly good character to me she just needs a werewolf uncle and we can re recreate the adams family oh no i don't want the kid to be a mage definitely not i love clan friendship or enmity as flaws as well i think that really plays into the game the kid is not a ghost god everyone's obsessed with sophie's child okay yep everyone is obsessed with uh, definitely this daughter so we've got a lot of um female focus in this puerto rican chronicle we have sophie we have her sire simone we have her daughter and who's 11 and a half years old and apparently a changeling mage and the mother will use her aunt as the babysitter why not thank you omega draconis she likes cats um no she does like cats uh yeah that is the end of character creation now what i would recommend is if anyone has any questions regarding character creation now is the time to ask while we're still here hopefully that's given you some of an idea behind how to create a character think of the mortal first why they were embraced whether it was intentional whether the sire stuck around whether there was a purpose to it and assigning dots to make sense on the character sheet don't be afraid of actually using the dots to actually power your disciplines because there's no point choosing disciplines that you then can't use to decent effect otherwise you're not going to have fun felix tibbles is the second is a tomcat and lord of the cats well it's interesting to have a kid whose mum became a vampire yeah i don't know i think the fate of sophie's kid is going to be very a very bad one i think the person playing sophie will find uh, him or herself focusing on the upkeep of the child for quite a while unless somehow sophie passes the child on to someone else but we know sophie ran away to puerto rico i very much doubt sophie's family are there so it's not like she can say, pass her on to her mother or anything like that uh, so okay questions gimmel star i've watched your video but i can't find any more about the chonio guishin where did you find your info on them if you don't mind asking my my asking i'm afraid i can't tell you that uh, literally all you're going to have to be able to go on is my video until more is revealed about them
how reluctant am I to give myself five dots in something, the Inventist? Uh, always reluctant. I find that the challenge leaves the game when you have five dots in something. And also, um, at least if you go by the book definition, five dots is kind of the pinnacle of humanity, which is quite difficult to justify. Uh, do I ever allow bonus dots at creation if justified by the character? Uh, yes, sometimes. Uh, and I allow people to move dots around as well if they forget where they, if they put them in the wrong place. What's the best way to nicely dissuade sl snowflakes and twinks in character creation and encourage good, well thought out characters? By thinking of the mortal first. That is genuinely the trick. If you make them think of the human before they think of the vampire, they will almost always make a decent, well thought out character. But try and urge people who do that to not think of the profession as defining the mortal. I am not defined by my profession. I'm sure most of you aren't either. You're people behind that uh, role, that, you, that professional role that you put on. As your character's should be as well you are defined by your friends your family your loves your hates we don't really know what sophie's hobbies are um right now all we know that she was a student a mature one but that gave us some inclination into her life this is how you usually start making a character i usually start with concept and work my way out yeah i usually i encourage all my players to start with concept before we get on to vampire uh, status some people do like some people think i've got a really cool idea for a giovanni or i've got a really cool idea for a nosferatu that can work perfectly fine and some players do that masterfully however i've always had a lot more fun thinking about the journey the character's taken to get to where they are when they get embraced and their life maybe since then if they're not fledglings so when Sophie's child gets older can become a ghoul how a lovely thought a poor child are there any broken character builds worth mentioning well in the sense that anyone can min max in this game it's very easy to min max uh, if if that's a problem for you uh, in your role playing games because in a sense i did it by choosing disciplines that my attributes and abilities fuel uh, but i don't think it's really a problem in this game at least i very rarely think so sophie has a great beginning and many options for growth thank you very much steve for saying so so this isn't sophie's choice she only has one child i guess it's sophie's choice conclusion damn it space release you're not supposed to say that favorite derangement to play megalomania easiest one to play I have a question. What are your recommendations for pumping up your ghouls? How would you justify this? Like a brain taking a member of Gold's gym to help protect a weaker PC. Pumping up your ghouls. Uh, well, they are still mortals with the capacity to learn as mortals do. Uh, I suggest you get each of your ghouls to focus on a different discipline and master that so they can each f fulfill a different role. Uh, there's a very good James Herbert novel called Sepulchre where a vampire-like serpent creature, humanoid, employs four incredibly sadistic ghoul-like humans, uh, one of whom is used as a chauffeur, two are used as torturers, one is used as a sort of thug. Uh, they all have their different specialities. Uh, is the J. Rab asks, is the background influence supposed to be vague in its control or should it be narrowed in who it can affect? It's supposed to affect a certain field that you decide really um and that can be as broad as it just being political or it can be i guess parents uh, at the local school if you really want to the thing is most people don't play backgrounds as if the dots translate to dice but that doesn't have to be the case if you're trying to let's say roll something in downtime in a game or if you want to just make a quick check on whether your contacts can get you the information you can ask the player to roll Manipulation plus contacts, and that works. Same with influence. You can say, well, you're an influential person. I want you to use charisma plus influence, see how many people you win over to your side. Darth Reap wants to know, any plans on making a Serpent of the Light video? Mm, no, because they're just an anti-tribute. Um, there is a Tlakeek in V20 Ready Made Characters, though, which I wrote, as I mentioned before. Uh, it's linked in the video description. 
How do you play a character without any combat skills? I'm curious if you've dealt with a character like before. Sophie has no combat skills, so I would play them quite easily uh, without trying to sound too patronizing. You simply hide behind another character with combat skills or don't involve yourself in fighty situations. It's one of the main mistakes people make when they run a role-playing game, they automatically think that I say it's a mistake. It would be for me to do it like this because I don't enjoy uh, games that are combat after combat after combat or where every single session has to have a fight. In reality, very few people like to throw punches, let alone blades or bullets, at one another. And I don't see why being immortal would make you any more disposed to punching someone else in a bar. So in a game like Vampire, I find physical characters seem to be a hell of a lot more situational than social ones. What I think about the upcoming Changing the Lost stuff, oh, well, let's wait and see on that, eh, Nater? No, um, hopefully won't be long. Jason Schmidt asked, which sect do you believe is the best to introduce new players into the world? Anarx, without a doubt. Omega Draconis wants, I ha says, I have a friend who is a great guy to play with, but he min-maxes his power games really hard. How do I get him to stop politely? Uh, ask him to play a character with a uh, physical flaw that's quite debilitating. Make him think around it without actually empowering him. Uh, I don't mean punish him, but actually... Well, to be honest... Most min-maxes can be dealt with by being given interesting challenges that don't necessarily apply to where they maximize themselves. They should be allowed to revel in the fact that they're good at something. You shouldn't punish them for being good at something, but you shouldn't just feed them things they're good at. A lot of min-maxed characters feel like they're good all the time because they're always put in the same situations that make them good. In Dungeons & Dragons and Pathfinder, it typically means that you're excellent at combat and nothing else. But that's because those games have an awful lot of combat in just by default. They are monster-slaying games as a general rule. I like them, but that's what they are. Um, so when you start throwing in political discussions, courtroom dramas into your D&D game, then your min-maxer has to start thinking around his abilities. Uh, Nikki Omer wants to know about sexual preferences of the character. Sophie, well, we never actually ascertained that, but we do know that she has a daughter. Uh, that doesn't mean that she's still, well, that she is heterosexual, of course, by any stretch. But we never really got onto it. Maybe it's something to explore in the future. It is the ward floor, Andre. Uh, thank you very much for pointing that out. It is in Well 20, which must be what I was thinking of. Uh, I was actually thinking, by the way, after this video, in a week, let's say, I will do a how to create a werewolf or werewolf 20 and we'll go down the line like that. Uh, yes, the ward floor is close enough and I think the child would often be in danger if its uh, parent was a vampire. What's my opinion on custom clans and disciplines? Mm, uh, well, disciplines are very hard to moderate because they need playtesting. Clans, fair enough, but you might as well be kite if... I guess there's a certain... You, you know, you can play whatever you like, you can play however you like. I like to... I don't play Vampire pure as it is out of the book. I make various changes to clans when I run it. I have my house rules, but I haven't ever had anyone just create their new clan or discipline wholesale. I'm sure it can work, but uh, there's a lot of room for broken, overpowered powers. Ms. Sil wants to know, will we see any more of this character going forward? Well, maybe. We'll see. She might turn up in an intro to a video at some point. What do I see as the major themes of this character? Thank you, John, for the question. I think Sophie's major themes are now going to be the struggle to maintain the relationship with her child, whilst also applying her... Well, can she transition her knowledge of the corruption in mortal politics to the immortal politics of the Sabbat and the Anarchs? Is she at all interested in the Anarch struggle, or is she just going to try and escape them? We know she's fled adversity before. Is she just going to flee the Anarch movement? 
I don't see her as a traitor. I don't think she'll suddenly go to the Sabbat. We haven't seen that she's got any monstrous impulses. But we do know she's a power gamer, a political power gamer. So what that might mean is she might help this new Anarch Baron get just close enough to the throne and then take it herself. Yes, yes, yes. Supposed to choose a derangement I don't have in real life. Very clever. Uh, <laughs> who said that? Um, Mr. Red, do I think it's worth creating a character sheet if you only plan on writing small-time short stories? I don't think you need to do the full character sheet like I did using Mr. Golden's character sheets. I think you can actually just write down the abilities and attributes that you have and disciplines. A coterie of three to six players, what ranges and different kind of characters do you like? I think a balanced coterie actually makes them the best play. I don't mean even mean mechanically. I mean that it's good to have a range of physical, social, mental characters simply so that you the storyteller can come up with various different scenarios to put against them. But yes, do uh, do check out V20 Ready Made Characters. Uh, it has all the characters, loads of characters I created in it, and loads of plot hooks as well. It's only four dollars ninety nine on Drive Through RPG, and there's a link in the description below. What's my actual rulings for ghouls, and how is it played out? Because the whole ghouling thing seems to draw a blank in the community, and how much control you have over them. Uh, I would recommend you check out Ghouls and Revenants for V20 for more advice on that. It's on Drive Through RPG. Uh, the Inventus favorite character concept you wrote in the V20 book. You just wrote the ready-made characters one. My favorite character is probably Masha Blumenfeld who is actually the Toreador Primogen in my Ivory Wall game. That's right, I put one of the characters from the Ivory Wall in V20 ready-made characters. She has become official. She was the Toreador Primogen of West Berlin in that game. Uh, likewise, if you've actually... I sort of put this in for people who might notice it, but there's a couple of other characters that you may have noticed me mention before in there. Any plans on reviewing Mage 20? I won't review it, but I will discuss it in a video, definitely. How do I feel about characters that have tons of merits and flaws? I think there needs to be a limit. I can see why you don't like Shadowrun, because in every run you have to get into combat. Uh, I do actually like Shadowrun now. It's just the one experience that I found dreadful. Um... But, yeah, a lot of the time you have to get into combat. You don't have to in every single run, though. That, again, depends on the person running it, for, running the game for you. Uh, you could easily hack in and steal the information. You can carouse and seduce your way into the, um, the safe room and steal the data off someone's cyber deck, trying to get into Shadowrun parlance this late as night is difficult. Chummer. Have you any new info about the new products from Vampire that will come out soon, like the Prince's Gambit book? Well, Prince's Gambit's a card game that's coming out from Onyx Path. Check that out. It's by Justin Achille, famous from Vampire the Masquerade. Um, what else? Lore of the Bloodlines is coming out very soon, and that'll be, I imagine, within the next month. I wrote the Kia Seed and the Harbingers of Skulls for that book. So I think a Cthulhu-esque inspired elder can blend well into Path of the Beast. Yes, and in fact, that would be a very interesting concept for a Nosferatu or Gangrel. Would I create and play a Ravnos character? I've done it many times. My favourite Ravnos character was a human trafficker who genuinely felt like he was bringing Romanians over to America for a better life, only to find out they were being in well used as blood dolls by the Camarilla in the city. I what was his name? Um, Anton Popescu, maybe. Uh, yeah, that was good fun. Thank you very much, Shadow Serpents. Oh, I'll shill all night, Thorstein. Um, that is, you know, I make my commission. Well, I don't make much commission. In fact, all I make is discount from Drive Through RPG products for myself. So there we go. All right. Werewolves, indeed, werewolves will come next, hopefully next week. Get to Fenris Philodox, where we'll see what the viewers say on the night. Maybe off topic, how do I get 
stacked how do I stack ghouls that the vampire gets, i.e. if they go to the zoo and try to ghoul a tiger? A lot of animals are actually statted out in the twentieth anniversary core book and in Ghouls and Revenants. So again, I really do check it out. How do I feel about world governments dealing with vampires? What kind of conflicts do you I like to introduce? Society of Leopold and the Arcanum are uh, very good antagonists because they just have slight amounts of information, but they use it in very different ways. The Arcanum are um, very knowledge-based. They are librarians, effectively, like Giles and Buffy, whereas the Society of Leopold are religious fanatics. And I think it's worthwhile painting vampire hunters as not being holy, well, whiter than white, that's for sure. How do I think she'll integrate her idealist nature into her new unlife? It depends what she's an idealist in. And again, we didn't uh, define this. Is she an idealist in that she's a humanitarian, in that she's a politician, that she believes in purity of politics? And if so, will that gel with the anarch movement? That's what w would interest me for Sophie. Afternoon, Paul. Rummel. Do I think a vampire can genuinely fall in love with another vampire, or are they too cursed for that? Yes, uh, there is nothing stopping them from having the same emotions as a mortal. This is a misnomer that because you're a vampire, all you care about is the Vitae. I think it's said that in a few books, but I don't care for that idea particularly. The V20 certainly gets away from it, and Requiem even more so. And the main reason it cuts off an awful lot of avenues for role play if you can no longer express love and sorrow and it, you know if you're capable of anger and jealousy why can you not be capable of the decent emotions if anything it makes characters a lot more well more three-dimensional gives them more dimensions what do i think is the general opinion in the camarilla of pentex i very much doubt the camarilla has any idea of pentex or its goals uh, if it did, it would not have a clue how to deal with it. <clears throat> Do I have a great breed for Felix Tibbles II? Um, hmm, Turkish Angora? I don't see. I was, I was thinking actually a sort of house mog, a, um, a moggy cat that is a mongrel breed of multiple cats. Came all the way down to Puerto Rico only for its owner to be turned into a vampire. What a pisser. How do you do blood bond between sire and child? How strong? Uh, same old rules as exist in the game. Um, therefore, feed them a mouthful of blood and you'll lightly blood bond them. Another mouthful on another night and you strengthen the bond, etc, etc. Is there anything you look out for that is a red flag for a power gamer during character creation? Ariadne. Hello, Andrea. Um, yes. Putting anyone who puts five dots in generation is generally... Well, every single background has a tie-in to a, I guess, the character. So putting point dots in influence or status or fame or whatever all ties into the character builds them to make them strong the only backgrounds that i find get abused regularly are resources which gets abused less than generation the reason it gets abused less is because if you do have five dots and resources every other member of the coterie will put zero dots and resources and just live in your mansion and leech off of you um if you have five dots and generation though it's impossible pretty much impossible all right, no, impossible is too strong a word. It's a lot easier for a player to not justify that with character background because they can say, well, that's my sire. Do you know that my sire was seventh generation, so how, what what his story is is entirely up to the storyteller. What that's resulted in, what I've seen, is an awful lot of players will play an eighth generation vampire with no points in resources, no points in domain, no points in herd. So you're basically an eighth generation vagrant. That could be an interesting concept as long as you carry it out. But a lot of the time, these eighth generation players say, oh, well, this is shit. I don't have anywhere to live. I've got no status. I should be higher up the totem pole. So people who are just playing for the power level like that, it's a bit like people who start off the game with five dots across disciplines. I've got no problem with that, actually. But if they have five dots in one discipline, I might make an exception. 
Uh, my pleasure to answer your questions, Omega. Darth Reaper, do I enjoy... My, the, the comments keep flying all over the damn place. I apologize. So that's why I keep stopping. Um, do I ever play the Vampire the Masquerade LARP and how does it compare to tabletop? I do. I play in a Bath camera, a camera a game in the city of Bath in the UK. It's a Victorian era one. I was the prince for a time until someone tried to blow up my train. I prefer tabletop, however. I find LARP gets a little too predicated on the actions in downtime and people are a bit too careful about their characters in uptime. Uh, don't worry, Patrick, there will be another live stream at some other point soon. Uh, Jay Rab, is there anything in the camera which would restrict someone from ghouling everyone they meet? Yes, because you're not allowed to break the masquerade, and ghouling people is doing that every single time. What is your opinion on Demon the Fallen, Baryon? A few people have asked me this. I enjoy Demon a lot. Uh, I don't think of it in the same way as I think of other World of Darkness games. I think it's quite cheesecakey uh, compared to the subtlety of other World of Darkness games. Um, do I think a future sci-fi chronicle could work at once held a game 500 years in the future on a big dystopic space station? Yeah, that would be an incredibly interesting vampire game on a space station. Uh, Damon works. What do I think about the parts of Enlightenment? I think they have their place, but I would generally only use them in a Sabbat game or an independent vampire game. Any suggestions for using Salubri, Jason Schmidt? Use them sparingly. They are an interesting concept to use in a Masquerade era game. Uh, you could, in, in fact, make an entire chronicle around the fact that the entire coterie are Salubri neonates. Maybe a Salubri went out on one last bender. Uh, that what that means is uh, to get pissed, get drunk, embraced five child, uh, realized what he had done, exposed himself to the dawn. At which point, the following night, there's these five salubri fledglings. They don't know that they're hunted, they don't know that they are the subject of uh, an entire clan's persecution, an entire, entire sect's persecution. All of a sudden, you've got a chronicle. There you go. You can, you can pose these questions to me at any time, and I'll always come up with chronicle ideas. Bit jockey. Vampires that join Pentex would be an interesting as a story for antagonists. They want to ruin the world. Uh, normal vampires would find them to be cultists or something. They do. Pentex are pretty shitty, I can tell you that, as one of their directors. How do I handle quantities of blood required to make and keep ghouls? It's never really defined whether it's a pint of blood, a mouthful of blood, a drop of blood to make a blood bond, uh, so that can be quite difficult. I think you should just do it in well flavor rather than try and make it a mechanical thing. What was the hardest concept type I've ever played or tried to play within Vampire the Masquerade Metalith? Um, hardest concept is actually playing a um, out and out idiot. Uh, I don't enjoy playing morons. Uh, I'm. <laughs> because it means I can't interact on the, on a social level as easily. Um, I also am not a big fan of playing, um, let's see. No, no, I think that's pretty much it. Characters who do not in any way relate to other ones. I can't stand lone wolves either. What could, or maybe better phrase, what would be the, your idea for the Baron, her mentor, long-term goal of her embrace? I would assume that the Baron has zero political acumen. He probably raised, brought his, bought his position through the weight of his fists and maybe even the weight of his uh, money, and therefore he needs a politician on side now. He's realised that his fists can't get him any further against the Sabbats. Uh, this is Dojok's question. So that's why he's embraced this political student to do it for him. Uh, she could be an alt-right supporter. I don't much like the term alt-right. It's just right-wing will do. Nikki Yama, but um, yeah, there's no reason she couldn't be a fascist or, or Republican or conservative, call them what you will. Um, Shallow Serpent, I wrote the Kia Seed part. I do indeed. Um, for Lore of the Bloodlines. My GM directed me to your video on the Sombra. I found out about the Kia Seed shortly after. Uh, yeah, I'm turning out lots of content. Uh, look on Drive Through RPG for my name, uh, your Matthew Dawkins, and you'll see all the books I've written for so far that have been released. There's lots more that haven't yet. 
Uh, have I Seed wants to know, have I ever thought of making a bloodline based on bed bugs? That'd be fairly vile. Um, almost more Requiem based because there are also ghouled plants in Requiem called Mandragora. Do I think a vampire with high humanity can deal with werewolves without getting destroyed on sight? The books contradict themselves on that. I prefer to think that werewolves see vampires with have, as having worm taint whether their humanity is high or not. Uh, because I think werewolves are played best as tragic warriors who think that any vampire is evil, no matter whether that vampire is the best humanitarian that's ever existed, um, which means a werewolf could just cut his way through a vampire who is a saint and be completely unrepentant for that. Uh, Yep, and once again, the comments just scroll past. Have I ever played in a 13 clan chronicle? Um, no, because that would presumably require 13 players. I think that would be a uh, bit too much dark player, if that's what you're asking. There's actually a side point version of Vampire LARP in Montreal. What do you think of the concept? I like it a lot. Blade Runner-esque, Vampire the Masquerade. Any suggestions on keeping a sabbat pack productive? Yes, get them focusing on philosophy, Shadow Serpent. What is their objective other than hunting down antediluvians and combating the Camarilla? They have to find meaning to their existence and it can't just be bloodshed. Where am I streaming from? My study, Red Ranger. Gold401 says, Hi guys, I'm on 722 subs. If you get me to 723, that'll be amazing. I'm going to request at this point, don't feel the need to subscribe to him uh, okay has anyone ever told me i look like prince lacroix from vampire the masquerade bloodlines yes one of my fellow writers steffi devan told me that this week and also uh, said i want someone i want a photo reference um for prince lacroix because he's appearing in her la tabletop vampire game and he's a real prick without realizing that saying that to me and taking my photo she was actually saying i look like a real prick but anyway nice nice lady no i like steffi a lot thoughts on the encyclopedia vampirica really brilliant book excellent resource just don't try, don't get too frustrated with the margin notes being completely out of sync with the text what was my favorite venue from the chronicles of darkness line uh, my favorite line for chronicles at least second edition it's either got to be Requiem 2nd Edition, which I think is about as perfect a vampire game as you could ever find, or Promethean the Created, which is absolutely excellent. Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't be too interested in a 13-player game, Dark Player 85. I think it's just too much to manage. I don't think you'd be able to give each player enough social focus. Shadow Serpent says, I'm one of the fullbacks to help in his debates about Vampire, and hopefully I will get more buzz. Good. Click on the links below. Uh, <laughs> that's all the buzz I need, and on any adverts that appear on these videos, as they do, apparently. I, Xavier says, I love your Dark Ages Vampire talks. Any chance you'll be going into that or Victorian Age Vampire anymore? I'd have to be running a chronicle for that. Uh, well, I'm up to date with comments. Uh, the Inventor says, I briefly played in Vampire the Masquerade YouTube experiment. Do I still contribute? I don't. I just don't have the time or inclination, really, to play in that medium anymore. Perfectly good medium, um, but it's not my medium anymore. I'm just really glad it's still going, and I'm glad loads of people have a chance to roleplay through it in that respect. I think it achieved its aim. A lot of people have a lot of fun with it still. Uh, hmm, what would I recommend for a Spanish Sabbat leader? Chronicle played in Spain. Uh, I'm not sure what you're trying to ask, Xavier. What would I recommend for a Spanish Sabbat leader? Um, it depends where they're based. If they're in Spain, a knowledge of history and how the Civil War went would probably help. Probably uh, help dictate how their fellow Spaniards would work. Savage GM, thoughts on the new Vampire Story video game? <laughs> I'm not getting drawn in on that one uh, on this live stream. I'm sure um, some of you are aware of that at this time. 
how would I go about running a monster mash kind of game with several game lines in one chronicle? Ooh, stay tuned for that on Chronicles of Darkness. Uh, a crossover chronicle. Do I recommend Beast the Primordial? I do recommend Beast the Primordial. I did a discussion video of it recently, and you can probably see it as related uh, to this one on the right, maybe. If you're watching on a PC. Um, but I recommend watching my video, not because I want the views, but because I think I impart some advice that you may not necessarily pick up by skimming beasts. Uh, Fargoth once says, I'm writing a chronicle, I'm thinking about making the Camarilla players infiltrate Sabat territory, trying to pass as a Sabat pack. What will be their chances, in your opinion? I think it will be fun if you write it to make them go through some of the Sabat rites, the Ritai or Rite, if you prefer, um, and see how their humanity holds up. Thoughts on World of the Apocalypse? Love it, Kid Banff. I, and I especially like the antagonists. How about the Werewolf video game? Oh, the Werewolf video game that's coming up, Nine Tails Chaos Fox. No idea what's going to be in it. It's by Cyanide Studios, but uh, I'm looking forward to it. Um, I think I'm going to have to call it there. Folks, thank you very much for watching. Interesting to note that the character generation probably only just took about an hour which when you compare it to some role-playing games is actually a remarkably brief time frame i know i know the system but hopefully what it's illustrated to you is it's actually incredibly simple to make a vampire character just start from the ground up sounds simple but really it is the best tool you can use so thank you very much for tuning in uh, if you're interested in some of the things i've written uh the vampire the masquerade uh, 20th anniversary edition of ready-made characters book is linked below as i've mentioned about a dozen times now along with the core book for v20 as i say v20 is the is the ultimate vampire game uh, for masquerade so and i recommend it i recommend so many of the supplements for it and again not just because i've written for it, i've had so much fun with this edition it's just so comprehensive everything you need in a masquerade game i will be streaming again next week with any luck and one last question if I could write a book for any game line that I haven't written for, which one would I pick? Asks Barry Orn. For a game line I've not written for yet, that is a very, very good question. I think I would love to write for Planescape, which would be difficult because Planescape isn't currently being published. If I could write for any game line, it would be that. Or Slay Industries. Uh, in terms of World of Darkness and Chronicles of Darkness, I think I've written for every line I really want to. Maybe Demon the Descent, that would be an interesting one to write. Uh, but yeah, that's me. Thank you very much for watching, for staying tuned. It's always appreciated. And I will see you again for Werewolf character creation, if not another video before that.